My name is Mark Chatterley. Um, I am a PSE patient. So this is kind of a potted history of my journey through uh, IBD and PSC, uh, which doesn't tend to follow or hasn't followed the same progress as a lot of the other talks we've had at other meetings, which sort of tends to lead to transplant straight away. So they thought I might be a bit more, uh, a bit interesting in a different way for people. Off the top, I am not a medical professional, so anything I say about the disease might be completely wrong. <laughs> so this is very much my experience. Um, I did plan to write this presentation over last weekend, but um, I ended up having to secure a website against someone who was trying to attack it. So um, I've got a lot of security on the mind. So just to prove I'm me, I've decided to put up a picture of me. Oh no, there's, where's the picture? Well, it flashed. That's incredibly secure. <laughs> this might mean that none of the images in my presentation work, which will be wonderful if that's the case. So we shall see. Um, Let's see. So I went through university. I came out of university in about 2005. Oh, I am going to have to keep going backwards and forwards. Um, I did what was affectionately known as a Mickey Mouse degree, creative and professional writing. It was actually one of the ones used as an example in the House of Commons as a Mickey Mouse degree, <laughs> which was very, very good to go out into the marketplace with that. But um, I did get a job, I, and, and I went to work. But I started getting a lot of stomach problems, and I imagine this rings true for a lot of you. And over the course of the commute to my first job, which was an hour and 40 minutes each way, 20 minutes cycling, an hour on the train, 20 minutes cycling, um, it got to the point after I'd been in work for maybe nine months that I wasn't able to make that commute anymore because I either couldn't hold in the urge to go to the toilet in the 20 minute cycling, or I'd have to sit on the loo in a train all the way to where I was going. And going to the toilet in a train is not particularly fun. Um, so the doctors started trying to investigate to figure out what was going wrong with me. It took a while. And while that was happening, I'm sure you've all seen the Bristol stool chart. Um, there we go. We'll do this. Um, basically, that was the journey of, of, of my stomach illness. I worked my way down from type 3 all the way down to the bottom over the course of about three months. I don't think the Bristol stool chart is complete, though. And I feel there is an edited version that has that at the bottom. Because at the end of my IBD-ness, the doctors didn't know what it was. Um, they kept saying I was lactose intolerant or gluten intolerant. And it wasn't until I was going to the toilet 20, 30 times a day that was just pure blood that they actually went, maybe we should have a look at what's going on in there which was it, was, it was a hard time. There was, and I'm sure those of you who have got IBD or something similar, you get quite windy with it. And, and there was a time me and my other half were on a walk around Cardiff, and I might have let one go. And he thought we'd walk past an open sewer, <laughs> which <laughs> was lovely. <laughs> so um, I've got what they used to call Crohn's colitis, indeterminate colitis, IBD unspecified. It's had multiple names. I don't even know if they're the same thing, that they're just different things doctors have told me I've got. But it responded well to treatment, which was basically steroids to begin with, and then Pantasa and Malsalazine and, and all of those other good things in various forms, tablets and enemas and all sorts of things. But that did quite well. However, I always had weird liver results alongside it, and the doctors didn't quite know what it was. They kept saying it was fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which kind of makes sense, because when you look at the little man, when you Google non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is where I got that image from, his diet is burgers, cheese, and fizzy drink, and that is pretty much all I survive on. <laughs> Maybe with a lot of pizzas thrown in. The, the middle bit where it's got fruit and vegetables. Mm. Don't have so many of them. But they, they thought it was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They kept testing me and, and basically told me it was nothing to worry about. Until one day, it was something I really needed to worry about. And I got a call saying I needed to go in for an MRI urgently. I was being seen by Oxford at this point. And um, so I went along and had the MRI. And what had happened is the LFTs had spiked, and they were very concerned about what was happening. So I went in and eventually got an appointment with Dr. Chapman after I had the MRI. Um, Dr. Chapman is a big PSC name person, like the granddaddy of PSC in the UK, kind of, I guess. Um, it was a very weird, I, I, I would claim um, his bedside manner wasn't great, because when um, I turned up for the meeting um, and he asked, um, do I know why I'm here? 
I said, not really. I know there's a very scary liver disease associated with Kaiser's. And he just went, yep, you have that. <laughs> and I did get to see some cool pictures of my bile ducts in black and white on his screen, which was quite good fun. Um, but that was my diagnosis. So this was around about 2009-ish. And from that point on, I just plodded on with life. I had my first contact with PSC support. I spoke to Ivor on the phone. He was quite brusque, um, but it was quite useful to know there are other people out there. This is before we had Facebook groups. We had an online forum, um, which was semi-used. It was quite good. But I like reading everything I can about diseases and, and what I've got. I like to be informed. And I understand there are some people out there who prefer not to be informed and just go with the flow. But I'm very much, I like reading. And I had lots more blood tests, lot, lots more rides on what I call the big black snake, which is the colonoscopy. Um, I, th I think it's a fair name for it. Um, I've had all the different types of prep you have to go through from Citramag, which if we can go back to Citramag, I will love everyone because it was, it's just two sachets and you make like orange hot chocolate flavored drink in two mugs and that's your prep done rather than Movi Pep, which is drink this slightly thick seawater tasting stuff. Oh, and by the way, you've got four liters of it. It's, it's not great, Movi Prep. Um, but so <laughs> that, that happened. Um, I was always on the lookout at the time because I'd read a lot about PSC of, is that the itch from PSC? And I imagine that's a question a lot of people who are new to PSC asking, is that itch PSC? Is that pain uh, PSC? And am I actually more tired than usual? When it comes to the itch, if you have to ask the question, is that the itch from PSC? It's not the itch from PSC. The itch from PSC is bonkers. There were, there were points when I got very ill, which I'll get onto later, where I couldn't feel a pen I was holding in my hand because the only signals coming from my hand was this unrelenting itch. And, and I couldn't, it was very odd. You couldn't, I couldn't feel the sensation of holding things because it was just itching. And, and I, I took to walking around my house with, in bare feet because I have um, quite coarse, low budget rental carpets, just scraping my feet along the ground. It's really good. The other thing that's really good, buy corduroy jeans because then you can sit there and do this and it's really good. <laughs> you have to wear corduroy jeans though, so it depends how much you like fashion, I guess. Um, I got civil partnered in 2011. Um, I, I say civil partnered because I'm not, I wasn't at the time allowed to call it marriage. It wasn't marriage because I was getting married or civil partnered to a guy. The good thing is though, is that at the time straight people got married, we became civilized, which I thought was very good. But my, <laughs> I tried to get my other half to agree to let me wear a top hat and a monocle to sort of go with the civilized thing and that was vetoed, so. But before um, we got married on a Sunday, we got civilized on a Sunday. And on the week leading up to it, I was starting to feel sick. When I was going into work, there was this sort of, I was on the bus going, I don't know if I can make it without throwing up. I wasn't eating and I had a, a new pain, which kind of started in the upper right quadrant and sort of moved across the stomach and backwards and forwards. So I went to my GPs as I do. They did the usual blood test and gave me a load of useless advice because they don't know what to say. There's not a lot GPs can do really. Um, the advice was, if it gets worse, go to A&E, and no amount of my protestations of getting married on Sunday would, would stop that advice. But they took the blood. That's, that's, that's me. Kidding. We were very, very nice. Look, we even got, um, I don't do fashion. And then what are the waistcoats? We got waistcoats and little neckerchiefs. I, was, I have never looked that good in my life. Um, but on, on the Monday, so the day after we got civilized, um, we were eating breakfast. If anyone's been to Cardiff, there's lots of Victorian covered little markets and there's lots of very posh eatery places in there. So we were spending a lot of money on what was essentially a croissant that heated up in a microwave, but it cost money and we were fr carefree at the time. But I got a phone call from my GP panicking uh, and was like, I don't know what to do. These results are madness. You need to forward these on to Dr. Chapman. So I did that. Tuesday morning, I got a call from Oxford saying, you need to come in, you're being admitted to hospital. And so of the first five weeks of married life, three of them were spent in hospital for me. So that was a really great honeymoon from the NHS. Don't do it. Don't do NHS honeymoons. Um, and what I hadn't realized is over, over that time, I'd been going more and more yellow. But because I was looking at myself in the mirror every morning, I didn't notice the change. Um, and I've got quite olive-colored skin anyway. 
so it didn't really show up. What I did have, though, is lots of people telling me that my teeth were looking particularly white. So uh, <laughs> that, that's now a marker for me of whether I'm going particularly yellow, is how white my teeth look rather than how yellow I look. But um, while I was there, um, Dr. Chapman from the blood test went, I think it's time for a new liver. So I had um, lots of tests all of a sudden while I was an inpatient. ERCPs, ultrasounds, MRIs. My ERCP, I don't know if this is usual, and there's a talk about ERCPs, but it was over an hour I had the down-the-throat snake. That's not a pleasant snake either. Any snakes the NHS wants to give you, not pleasant. Um, but the doctor who was doing that agreed that it was time for a new liver. So... I got referred up to Birmingham. And this is where things started going quite quickly and slowly. Uh, quickly in a sense that lots of tests happened quite rapidly. Quite slowly in the sense that, um, as I, I come to on a slightly further slide, from Dr. Chapman saying, you need a new liver, I'm referring you up to Birmingham, to actually get into Birmingham for the liver transplant assessment was five months. And that was five months of me being very, very ill. Um, I got yellower. I lost four stone in two months. Um, that's a lot of weight to lose. And then that includes the, um, does, doesn't include the one stone I lost in the run-up to the civil partnership that I hadn't realized I was losing. Um, and I stayed on long-term sick from work. So at this point, I was in a new job. I'd only just passed my probation period. Like, I, on the Friday before the wedding, I was my probation period ended. And so I was entitled to sick pay, and I didn't come back to work. <laughs> so... That was good. I don't think they, they appreciated me as an employee, though. But um, that was, yeah. Being, and I spent a lot of that time on the sofa watching Stargate, which is a very, there's lots of episodes of Stargate. So if you need something to watch, you can mainline like six Stargate episodes, and the day flies by. And there's like 400 episodes in the series. It's great. Um, those are pictures. They're meant to show how yellow I was. I don't know how well it shows up there. but. That's me on the, on the left with very yellow eyes. And me on the right, that's actually when I was starting to get better. You can see how much weight I'd lost. And I'm actually holding orange juice there. And the orange juice is almost the same color as my fingers. Um, which I just like those two photos. Um, yeah, so five months. And then the transplant assessment I had was over two days. Am I doing OK for time? OK, good. Um, I, other talks have covered this, but um, quickly, day one of the assessment was over two days. Day one, lots of tests, liver, uh, liver ultrasound, chest x-ray, peeing in a pot, uh, a general workup, which is like uh, blood, weight, height, MRSA swabs, all of that kind of stuff. And, and again, lots of bloods, 19 vials there were there. They wanted to do more, but the nurse who had the vials had disappeared. So um, there were two I didn't have, um, which I was quite glad because that's a lot of blood to take. Um, and then you had chats with the transplant coordinator privately in a group, and then you have lunch. So all of that was before lunch on day one. And then you come back, and the afternoon tests, the ele uh, electrocardiogram and the echocardiogram, they're nice and easy. One of them is just lay down, I'm going to stick some stickers on you, and then you get to lay there for two minutes. It's great. Uh, those tests, any tests where you get to lie down, best tests to have. Day two, um, very frank discussion with what happens in a transplant. Quite shocking in the amount of detail they go into. My other half freaked out. Um, I was kind of okay. And then you have this X Factor style thing where you interview with the surgeon and the liver consultant. They both said no at that point to me being listed. And this is where my journey kind of deviates from a lot of other people's journeys. Um, the way I had it explained to me is because it was autoimmune and it kind of comes and goes. When Dr. Chapman first referred me, my UCAD store, when they used the old-fashioned UCAD, was enough that I would have been very high priority. But in the five months, everything had sort of waned away a bit. And even though I was ill, um, I wasn't ill enough to be uh, put on the, the transplant list. My UCAD score kind of hovers. Oh, what's the cutoff for UCAD? 49. So my UCAD score kind of hovers around 47, 48-ish now and never quite hits the threshold. Um, I tried to return to work. Um, my job was a full-time job, so occupational health was very supportive, for supportive, but I could never get back more than three days. Um, whenever I tried to do more than three full-time days, I just started going yellow again, getting very sick, and then I'd have to take the next week off to recover. Um, so I had to look at other plans. My, my job was managing a team. I couldn't do that three days a week when they needed someone there, five days a week. So luckily... Um, a friend of mine offered me a part-time job working in his charity, uh, which was a charity that installs charging stations for electric cars. Um, electric cars is an area I'm very enthusiastic for. Um, alongside that, 
because my degree in writing, I've got quite nice work on my own skills. So me and a friend set up a news review website for electric cars, one of the first ones. So I got to review lots of expensive electric cars. That's, a, that's the first ever Tesla Model S that got into Europe. That car cost 140,000 pounds. I, I got to drive it, it was amazing. It was my first time driving in London. Um, that was the European model, so it was a left-hand drive. So it's my first time driving a left-hand drive car and the car was worth more than the flat um, I was living in. I was terrified. And, and if you know anything about Tesla, these cars do like 0 to 60 in about two seconds. They are bonkers. It's gr it was a great job. Um, and I started freelance writing. I started freelance writing for a venture capital website, which is a horrific job because you just write about rich people getting richer. And I hated it. The worst, the worst article I had to write was a, a poor, a, a sort of a, a sob story about a London investor who'd gone up to Scotland to head up the UK Green Investment Bank. And he was taking a pay cut for this job because that's how much he loved the Green Initiative. And he was only going to earn four million a year in his new job. <laughs> only four. But um, over, the, over the previous seven years, so this is a sort of seven year span, my energy levels have dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. So I've had to phase them out. So I, I, I did my freelance writing. I started my own business as well, because you know, if, why not? This is all easy in a full-time job, isn't it? So eventually I phased out uh, the part-time job I was doing. I phased out the websites. Uh, I phased out the freelance writing. And I now just work on my business that I've set up, um, which is actually very useful because it allows me to manage my own time. In terms of how much energy I have nowadays, I get about two or three hours of useful energy a day, and that's it. Um, so I get up, I walk the dogs, I get in from walking the dogs about 10 a.m., and I can work till 12. And usually if I'm not feeling sick at that point and I want to then carry on working, I can do, but I do so in the knowledge that the next two days I won't be able to work at all because I will feel sick um, and, and tired and won't be able to do anything. Um, and, and that, I think, is the crux of a lot of what I'm talking about is, is how little energy I have now. I would define myself as very ill, very tired, and sort of controlled by meds. So my pain is controlled by meds. My itching, if I don't take my itching medication, I can't sleep. Um, and, and I don't know if I, people here must have experienced it, but operating on six hours sleep in a week is not good. Um, so controlled by meds, but I'm a very ill person. Uh, I got admitted to hospital for cholangitis for the first time in my life uh, about a month ago and learned that I probably should have been in A&E a few times before that too. I, I went into A&E after a night of, uh, of rigors. I, I couldn't walk. I was shaking so much. I had a fever. Um, everything was yellow from pee to eyes to skin. Um, and I went in and the doctors in A&E went, well, you don't have a fever right now because it had come down a little bit. Um, just go home and take paracetamol if you get a fever. But come in in three days' time and we'll do a follow-up with you. In those three days, I, I had lots of fevers, lots more shaking, um, but eventually started getting better. And when I went back for the follow-up, I was feeling sort of back to my normal-ish self. Um, they took some bloods and I suddenly started asking for Dr. Ferguson's details, my specialist in Birmingham, and they'd admitted me. Um, and, and no amount of me going, I, I actually feel pretty good now. Three days ago when I was here, I felt like I was dying and you sent me home. Um, but yeah, that, so I got admitted when I felt better and ended up in hospital for a week having as many bags of IV antibiotics they could chuck at me. Since then, oh, I felt so much better. Like the two weeks after I had all those antibiotics, I had more energy, less pain and less itching than I've ever had in the past 10 years. It was crazy, but that's gone now. So I'm back to being ill, which is great fun. Uh, looking back, no transplant, is, is, was that a good thing? Was that the right decision? From a medical point of view, and this is, I'm sure, your point of view, is probably yes, living with a transplant isn't a cure. From a lifestyle point of view, in my life, I wish I would have had it somehow, because my career was in the tech industry. Um, I've been out of that for 10 years. My job doesn't exist anymore. I, I couldn't go back to it. If I went back to that world, I'd be starting out at the bottom again. So my career has been destroyed. The only way, reason I've been able to make any money in the past 10 years is because I luckily had those, I can sit at home and write skills. I had those soft transferable skills. So if it wasn't for that, for the past 10 years, I wouldn't have had any income. And, and I feel that the, 
the quality of life aspect of living with something that's sapping energy over 10 years is, is, is quite shocking and quite hard to describe to a doctor. No offence, you guys, sorry. But it, <laughs> it is quite hard to... And especially because the first question doctors ask are, how are you today? And my automatic response to how are you today is, fine, thanks, how are you? <laughs> and then I have to sit down and go, actually, I'm not fine, and, and this is happening, and, and now I can only work two hours a day rather than the four hours I could work three months ago. And I, I don't know what the answer is. If, if you guys can give me anything that's legal to give me energy, I would take it in a heartbeat, because the lack of energy is actually, I think, the most life-crippling thing. It might not be the hardest to deal with in terms of pain is quite hard to deal with, but it's the most life-crippling cri thing to deal with. Um, but looking back, what, what has Limbo got me? I wouldn't have my dogs if I didn't go into Limbo. We got the dogs to give me, <laughs> to essentially force me out of the house so I can try and get some sunlight for vitamin D. Um, the one on the left is called Snoopy. That's him after walking in the rain sitting next to the radiator. And the one on, one, one on the right is Chai. I'm actually lucky she's uncovered there because she usually hides underneath a cover and just sleeps all day. They're two lovely dogs. Um, my company, this is kind of what my company does. I help uh, podcasters and audiobook people sell what they do. So that's a USB tape that looks like a cassette that, that I make for them. Uh, the reason I went into that world is that when I was in hospital for those three weeks, audiobooks and podcasts are what got me through. Um, spoken word media is what got me through because I was too sick to even stare at a screen. That sometimes makes me feel worse. So just listening to something really helps. So my business is kind of set up around helping those people who helped me. Um, I've got lots of new friends. These are some Australian podcasters who come across to the UK for tours, and I set up big tours, so that's nice. It's me just, I'm just showing off now with pictures of myself. Um, <laughs> and and I, I like baking. I got really into baking. These are some wedding cakes I've made some friends. So there's a unicorn wedding cake on the left, and me with the unicorn horn. Um, the ones on the right are book wedding cakes, so I had to learn how to paint to do book covers. There's lots of pictures of baking, by the way. Sorry, this is the nice, happy part. Um, that's a wedding cake on the left and a mirror cake. Some more cakes I did. Uh, oh, let's go. That one got, ooh. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> that's that's good. Um, and then this is something that's going to go around on Twitter. Compare yourself 10 years ago to how you are now. Um, so that was me in 2009 uh, on the left, quite a big boy. I've always been a big boy. It's good. Dr. Ferguson called me skinny for the first time. I've never been called skinny before in my life. And when I went and seen him, having lost five stone, he was like, oh, no, you present as a usual PSC patient at this stage. You're, you're yellow and you're ill and you're very skinny. And I was just like, what? <laughs> since I've been 14, I've been an overweight middle-aged man. That's what I've looked like since I've been 14. So very happy at that. But I think you can see the difference in those two pictures. I don't, I don't even think about what I eat. I eat junk food for energy. I drink fizzy drinks for energy. And I am much thinner now than I have ever been before. And that's just because of, I guess, the way my body processes food. And every now and then when I don't eat for a week because I don't have an appetite. Um, there's a blank slide there for no reason. Uh, <laughs> I don't, what was that slide? There was a slide there. Don't know what it is, but let's ignore it. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is... is if you do get the chance to go on trials, I did a trial earlier on this year. Um, it was very exciting and fun to be on because you get doted on by, like, you get, like, two personal nurses and a doctor comes and checks on you. You have the most service you've ever had, ever. Um, I had a very good reaction. I'm, I'm not going to say which trial I was on. I had a very good reaction to it. I, if they offered me another dose of medication, I'd take it in a second because I went from my two, three hours of energy a day to having all the energy back, well, it was like rewinding the clock seven years. I had not full amount of energy, but maybe seven hours of usable energy. So it would get to like six, seven o'clock at night when I'm usually thinking of going to bed. And I was sitting on the sofa going, I'm going to paint a wall. And I painted a whole room. It was, it was amazing to just be able to do things again. And also, sometimes when you're on trials, your medication is delivered by Daleks, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so basically, it's kind of a plea to do trials, because if people don't do trials, these medicines don't just hang around and then maybe come to us. If, if not enough people do the trials, those medica medications just don't happen. So that was kind of my plea to everyone to do trials. Um, but that's it. I'll go back to the blank slide. That was the end slide. That's what I'm claiming that blank slide was. But I, I, if I've got time, I'll take any questions if there are any. But that was my kind of rambling presentation. Thank you.